Yes. Sorry. Good afternoon. Today is October the 1st. It is Thursday. And today we are going to talk about um, how England and France went in different directions to uh, create governments. And uh, I've not had it. Today has been the first day I'm recording this after the first day of school. I'm really kind of nonplussed. Um, and so we'll just see how this turns out. And so um, shall we begin? So um, as it says there, this chapter is about the two different paths that England and France took towards their governmental system. England towards constitutionalism or becoming a constitutional monarchy um, and France toward absolutism or becoming an absolute monarchy. And it all comes down to, Machiavelli would have loved it, it all comes down to money. That's not right. How did I do that before? Anyway, uh, we'll look at that later. Uh, only monarchies that had built a secure financial base, which was not dependent upon the support of estates, diets, or assemblies of nobles, achieved absolute rule. You say, what does that mean? Only rulers who were able to squeeze money out of their populations without having to ask somebody for it were able to be absolute rulers. That's what it means. Uh, France succeeded in this and had an absolute monarchy uh, with Louis XIV for, as a, its prime example. We'll talk about him later on. But yeah, uh, the French succeeded in this. England did not. England had to ask people for money. And because they ask people for money, when you ask people for money, people normally want something in return. And so they began the long, slow path of give and take, negotiate. It is called, and you're writing, power of the purse. In fact, shall we write that down? It is called the Say, well, what does that mean, Mr. Horton? Power of the purse is the power that uh, legislates, basically, it goes all the way back to that Disney movie Aladdin, the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. Well, the king needed money, and so he had to ask somebody for money. And like I said, eventually, when you ask somebody for money, they want something back. And so they began negotiating. Well, I'm going to give you some money. But we need this. We need you to do this for us. We need you to give us certain powers. To be honest, that's pretty much that's the way our government works. Remember that the president of the United States does control certain funds, but the great majority, the money of the United States Treasury is controlled by the Congress of the United States. They make the taxation bills. They make the spending bills, the majority of them. So, even Louis XIV of France had to depend somewhat on the cooperation with the local nobilities for money and authority, the so-called parliaments. That is a good word, and that is not misspelled. Parliaments. Parliaments, uh, the many districts in France were ruled by parliaments. Uh, these were town councils made up of representatives of the clergy and the nobility uh, and the richer people in France. And so sometimes Louis XIV had to ask them for money. In England, radical religion was the culprit. And there's that name again, the Puritans. We talked about them the other day, the pilgrims. With the Puritans having a heavy hand while in France, Louis XIV crushed all Protestant resistance. Um, by, for one thing, he kicked out the last of the Huguenots. In England, Parliament, you misspell that. Now, this time I did misspell it. Parliament had developed a tradition and an expectation of being consulted on taxes made and laws made and repealed. So, and you need to somewhat know this. Edward II 
who actually predates our period of study. Edward II, also called Longshanks, he's the nasty king in Braveheart, if you ever watched that film, which is, I'm not a Mel Gibson fan. But yes, um, Edward II needed money for an invasion of Scotland. And he said, yo, uh, hey, nobility, guys, I need some money. And the nobility, they struck a bargain. And that bargain was, and this is important, that bargain was that from every shire, you say, what's a shire? Shire is like a county, okay? Uh, from every shire, each shire would send to the king representatives. Two from the nobility and two from the commoners. The nobi representatives of the nobility collectively as a group became known as the House of, and you're writing, the House of Lords. The representatives of the commoners, and by the way, the commoners were not, you know, peasants. They were not um, poor people who had no money. The commoners were people who had money. Uh, they were represented. And that became, as I'm sure you know, the House of Commons. Originally, the House of Lords was the more powerful of the two houses. But more recently, just about every bit of legislation done in England is done through the House of Commons. Prime Minister is elected from the House of Commons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, in France, there was a legislative body, and it was called, and you see it there, the Estats General. Okay, now once again, you're writing. The Estats General was a type of legislature, and it was made up of representations of, count them, the three estates. The three estates. The clergy, the nobility, and is my finger bent? The clergy, the nobility, and everybody else. The clergy made up about one percent, nobility made up about one and a half percent, and of course everybody else made up everybody else percent, ninety seven point something percent. <coughs> Sorry. And each of the three estates in this estates general got one vote. I don't mean per person. I mean the entire estate. So you know where that's going. The few, the being the clergy and the nobility, always outvoted the many, being the peasants, serfs. But even with that, the estates general was a little more than a figurehead organization. France, at the time, was led by two capable churchmen, names you should know, Cardinal Richelieu and Jules Mazarin. Both were Roman Catholic cardinals, and both served in the same capacity. And that capacity was this, that when Louis XIII was a child, he became king of England. I think he was um, eight years old. He became king of, did I say England? France, sorry. Louis the Thirteenth became the king of France, and you can't have somebody that's eight years old being king of France. And so they chose to rule in his stead a regent, and that regent was Cardinal Richelieu. He was regent for Louis the Thirteenth. Jules Mazarin will be the regent for Louis the Fourteenth, and we'll get to that story later on. But yeah. Both of them were rather capable churchmen, rather powerful. England at the time was led by the Stuarts. Remember I told you that that, uh, that dynasty was coming. They succeeded the Tudors. They followed the Tudors. Uh, a weak line of kings, to say the least. James I. Um, John I. You say John? Yeah, John. Uh, King John. Actually, Prince John. Um I'm so dumb. I'm going to fix that right now. Horton, you are dumb. Now you're saying, now, 
Mr. Horton, why did you put your own name there? Well, once again, I was writing these notes in a hurry, and uh, when I wrote them, I wrote down John because John Charles is my name. So, go back to the, the Stuarts. James I, Charles I, Charles II, and James II. Once again, the Stuarts, and actually, um, you can actually throw in there. Queen Anne, and those are the Stuarts in both England and France. The nobility, of course, were at the top of the social scale. The French needed to cater to the monarchy. The French nobility needed to cater to the monarchy. <laughs> And the king catered to them. You say, what does that mean? In France, the nobility and the clergy did not pay taxes. Say again. In France, the nobility and the clergy did not pay taxes. All taxes came from, in France, all taxes came from the third estate. Basically, um, the poor. And people who had gained wealth but weren't members of the clergy and nobility. Terrible system of taxation, but it worked for about 300 years. He protected, he, the king of France, protected the nobles' tax exemptions, their wealth, and their social standing. Okay, let's go back to England, shall we? James I, you recall, succeeded Elizabeth I after her death in 1603. <coughs> <coughs> James was a Protestant. Calvinist, he, yeah, not well known. His mother had been executed for treason. Um, and that's wrong. James is not a Protestant. James was a Catholic. He was a closet Catholic, meaning he hid his Catholicism. His mother had been executed for treason, accused of plotting against the queen. James, however, was a strong advocate of this thing called divine right. Okay. What is divine right? Mm -hmm. Divine right. Well, what is it? Let's see if I can remember the quote. Are you impressed yet? Yes, there it is. King by the grace of God, absolute in power, sacred in person, endowed with extraordinary wisdom, and responsible to God alone. You say, well, what does that mean, Mr. Horton? Well, I mean, you have to break it down into its component parts. Uh, king by the grace of God, what does that mean? It means who made the king the king? Was he elected? Did he win a bet? Did he? No, God chose him. That's what it means. King by the grace of God is absolute in power. How much power does he have? Well, he has absolute power. What does that mean? It means that one day, if he's riding down the road and he sees you, he says, Wow, Mr. Arlinghouse, you have a nice house. I think I would like to own your nice house. 
what happens? Answer, he owns your nice house. And then he starts looking at you and says, wow, Mr. Arlinghouse, I don't think I like you very much. I don't think you should be breathing anymore. Absolute in power. Absolute in power. Sacred in person. And this is one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time dealing with. But it is essential to understand. Uh, sacred in person. What does that mean? Sacred means holy. Sacred means uh, godly. Sacred means, for here's an example. The best example of an absolute monarch that we know of in Western culture is Louis XIV, the Bourbon King of France. Louis XIV, when he was uh, king, he had 150 members of the nobility, not just average people, members of the nobility, 150 members of the nobility who stood in line in the morning to help Louis the Fifth Fourteenth do his, shall we say, personal duties, the intimate cleansing and things of that nature that one does when one gets out of bed in the morning, they helped him. Do I have to spell it out for you? Yes. Yeah, that. All of that. his but see touching the king did you touch the king answer not if you valued your life for example a long time ago in a land far far away there used to be this uh, television program uh on called that came on sunday nights called disney presents and they would have some various kind of show or something and i remember watching one it was based on a story called the whipping boy and say well, what's a whipping boy a whipping boy was a companion that the royal family would get for a member of the royal family when they were children because remember even as a child he's a member of the royal family so the question is what do you do to a royal child when he is bad and they do are bad from time to time and the answer is they give them this playmate and when the king is bad they punish the playmate thinking that eventually the king will get the idea that you know maybe i shouldn't be bad because my playmate who i care about is getting roughed up actually it had just the opposite effect the monarch often became desensitized to feeling what other people felt. But the point of the matter is, you didn't touch the king. You didn't allow your head to be higher than him. You did not turn your back on the king and show him your backside because that was an insult. You see, yeah, sacred in person. His body was a temple endowed with extraordinary wisdom. What does that mean? He's like Horton. No, I'm just kidding. It means two things. Number one, the king is always right. Number two, if the king is wrong, refer back to number one. That's what it means. And finally, responsible to God alone. So if I decide as king to execute Mr. Arlinghouse, what court am I tried in? What jail do I go to? Answer, nada. None. Yes. Uh, and by the way, this theory is put forth in a book by a guy named Thomas Hobbes, who wrote a book called, and you know, do you know this one, Mr. Fuller? Leviathan. And the book Leviathan Let's quote.
Yeah. Without the strong rule of the state, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Meaning that the idea of the divine rights of king's law is that you need a monarch. You need an absolute monarch. Because if you don't have an absolute monarch, if you don't have a strong government, then your life will be nasty, brutish, and short. Well, the short part, hopefully, you understand. In other words, you're not going to live very long. Brutish meaning violent, nasty meaning just uh, people would revert to their most uh, basic instincts. Basically, the whole idea behind the divine rights of kings theory is that human beings, most human beings, are little more than cattle, little more than animal that have to be driven. And keep this in mind, Thomas Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes said these things, that human beings are cattle, they have to be driven, they have to be controlled, they cannot be trusted. Later on, John Locke is going to have something to say about that. Yes. But we were talking about, yes, King James. So this is good to know, though. That's good to know, though. That one and two there. No, I, yes, I do write them to show out, but yes, you also need to know them. The Divine Rights of Kings Theory. Thomas Hobbes, who wrote Leviathan, that without the strong rule of the state, life would be nasty, British, and short. Those are the kind of things you need to know for taking the AP Euro exam. Okay, so getting back to James, for income, he, James the first, began to take on, take, uh, take on new levies, uh, such called impositions, also called tonnage and poundage. You say, what does that mean? It means the guy illegally um, was able to squeeze money out of his people, even though I said it was illegal, by imposing taxes based on tonnage and poundage of things being shipped. Religious problems, though, harassed James I and his administration. Puritans, here we go with the Puritans again. Yeah, you better learn about these guys. Harassed James and his administration. Puritans within the Church of England. Remember that the Puritans were the most extreme of the Anglicans. And we're not done to talking about these Puritans yet. Sought to make the national church, meaning the Anglican church, the Church of England, more and more and more conservative. Yes. In January of 1604, James issued a millinery petition at a special religious conference at Hampton Court, one of the courts of the king. Uh, he also issued, here we go, very important note, the standard Protestant version of the Bible. I am guessing that in all likelihood, if you have a Bible in your home, that probably your Bible is the King James Version. Now, does that mean James I wrote it? No, but he had the Bible translated from Latin into English, which is why, if you've ever read the King James Version, and I have, and have read Shakespeare, and I have, they sound a lot alike. Why? Because Shakespeare and Shakespeare and King James, they weren't contemporaries, but they, Shakespeare lived about 50 to 60 years before King James. Uh, so yeah, the King James version of the Bible. And so that was his contribution to uh, faith was right, having a Bible printed in English. James and the Puritans also disagreed over the Sabbath. Puritans, and see, gotta love Puritans, felt that Sunday was for religion and nothing else. James felt that games and sports games and sports now you're not oh so James like baseball no uh, that was a nice way of saying um, gambling houses of prostitution uh, taverns being open, sports. <clears throat> I might have talked about sports before, but uh, sports like uh, pit fighting, bear baiting, um, 
those sorts of things. We did talk about bear baiting, didn't we? Bear baiting. Bear baiting, once again, was when uh, a bear was muzzled and chain, had his hind leg chain, <coughs> chained to a stake. And then dogs were set upon him. And the people watching the spectacle would bet how many dogs would die before the bear was finally uh, killed himself. Obviously, that's a cruel sport. The Puritans objected to that sport not because it was cruel to the animals, but because the people watching it enjoyed it. Once again, a Puritan's worst nightmare is that somebody somewhere is enjoying themselves. Somebody somewhere is having a good time. Uh, James felt that having things like this on a Sunday would actually encourage Catholics into the Church of England because... I don't mean to stereotype Catholics, but I mean, Catholics like to have their fun. So in 1620, a group of these Puritans founded Plymouth Colony, primarily to get away from the Church of England, which they felt had gotten too worldly. Um, James' administration was racked by scandal. He was known for using favorites. The Duke of Buckingham, supposed to be King James' homosexual lover. I don't know. Sold peer, peerages and titles. You say, what does that mean? Uh, this guy, the Duke of Buckingham, sold titles of nobility to the highest bidder, a practice that enraged the established nobility because, after all, they were, they had earned, well, they were born into their nobility, didn't work for it, that's for sure. James Warren policy also came under scrutiny. He had concluded a peace treaty with Spain. Protestants saw a peace treaty with Spain as being pro-Catholic. He also, James also tried to arrange a marriage between his son, Charles, who will become Charles I, and the Spanish Infanta, the daughter of the King of Spain. It's good to know such things, Infanta. James approached death, and more and more his kingdom was in the hands of Charles, his son, and the Duke of Buckingham. When he died, England entered into a continental war against Spain just to satisfy the anti-Catholic sentiment of Parliament. That is where we're going to end today, guys, um, because uh, it's getting late in the day. And yeah, we'll pick up with Roman numeral three there on Friday. Yes, Friday. So yeah, that, thank you all for being attentive, and I will see you, well, when I see you, but uh, yeah, I'll be, well, I'll be seeing you in this venue on Friday. Goodbye. No, 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 no. This is killing me. I hate this. That's not helping. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Anyway.